Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Hello, everyone. This is Bree Noble. Welcome to the podcast. I'm excited to be here with Arden Kaywin. We are going to talk about singing and just all the best practices for singers, how you can go from good to great. But before we do that, I would love to hear your background, Arden. I always think this is really fun when, you know, we re- met very recently and I don't know your story. So I get to learn your story along with everybody else listening or watching. So let's get into, you know, your musical background, your singing background, and, you know, how you then transitioned into what you do today. Yeah. Thank you, Bree, for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Um, so I am actually trained as a classical singer. I did that very traditional training. I went to Oberlin Conservatory after college and got my bachelor's in classical voice. And then I went to Manhattan School of Music. I got my master's in classical voice. Um, I did young artist programs. I sang uh, with San Francisco Opera, young artist program, Opera Theater St. Louis. I sang in, uh, you know, all over the country. I sang in Europe and I did that whole thing. And, you know, it was all very serious. It was all very serious opera training and and I loved it and I'm good at it. And it it it's it's my it is my sweet spot and the wheelhouse of my voice. And I got really burnt out doing that because it's for any of you listening who have that classical training or who are in that world, you will understand it's it is a very narrow perfectionist view of how to uh, sing and use your instrument and create your art. And it's also mired in all these other things like, you know, obviously technique, but performance practice, language, 200 years of history, what the conductor wants, what the director wants, what the composer wants, like, uh, you know, and so I can remember being at this stage of my career where like I was singing at a, (laughs) with a pretty good opera company that shall not be named right now. And I can remember the the director, or sorry, the uh, conductor, who was also very well known in his late seventies at that point, who was like one of the standard bearers, you know, in that community, tacking up a litany of things on my dressing room door during intermission of an opening night performance of all the things that he think that he thought that I needed to fix, do better, whatever. And I'm like, and and I was doing a supporting role, okay, and I'm looking at this that he you know, is telling the people who are doing the lead roles, who are, you know, 10 years ahead of me in their career, who are, you know, famous opera singers in this community and being treated the exact same way. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm, I'm never going to be good enough. Like I am never going to be happy. I was so burnt out on this because I just could not figure out how to bring my own artistry and my own, for lack of a better word, special sauce to this when everything going on in my head was all these perfectionist things that I needed to to do and be and I was not happy. And so I decided that I, I at that point, I was going back and forth from where I was uh, in San Francisco to Los Angeles. And I was recording because I had been hired to sing on a soundtrack for something. And it was the first time that I had really been in the commercial music world in the recording world. And I had always written music, but I, and I had written pop music, but I didn't tell anyone about it. Cause if you're an opera singer and you're writing pop music, you don't tell anyone because there's that like, is so oh, true looking down the nose, you know what I mean? So it was just something I did for fun. Like some people paint or keep a journal or whatever. I write, I wrote little pop songs, but then I had this experience of singing on this soundtrack and it was a female uh, film scorer and we got along great. And she was not a songwriter. She was more a scorer, but there were some songs in this and she and I ended up rewriting like half of them. And it was so fun. And it was like such a fantastic experience. And I was like, so burnt out in the opera world. So when my contract was done, I was like, I'm going to move to LA. And I'm just going to abandon ship on the opera world and I'm going to go into commercial music. So this was in my like late twenties. 
And and so I got signed to an indie label and I had like one foot in each community. I was because Opera World books out like a year or two in advance. So I would like fly to one city and do like, you know, whatever, Bach mass or something with orchestra. And then I would go and I would play like an open mic, <laughs> like, yeah. like a BMI event. Like, yeah. do you remember these songwriter circles that they used to do at Genghis Cohen in LA, like for BMI or whatever? So and and so then I really got involved in that world and I released two records and I licensed a ton of music to film and TV and I toured and I did that. And then because of my background as a classically trained singer, um, a lot of the producers that I would I was working with knew that that was my background. And so they'd say, hey, do you have a do you have a, like a, do you coach? Because I have an artist who like needs a little bit of help and I know that's your background. And so I kind of back out back doored my way into coaching and um, so when I had my daughter and I decided I didn't want to be on the road anymore and I didn't want to, you know, be doing 250 dates a year. And I really started focusing a lot more on coaching because I had this unique experience of being classically technically trained and really understanding the best, healthiest way to make a sound, but being able to teach artists of other genres how to be able to translate that into what they're doing with their body and their sound in a way that works for whatever genre you're singing. So I was doing that for a while, developed a, a seminal two month intensive program from it, which is a whole different cutting edge way of training. We can talk about that more later, but um, my mission is to be able to let everyone out there who is a serious singer, who really is using their voice for whatever they're doing, understand that there is a new and a different paradigm for how to train that gets better results in the form of the career that you want. Because I had been trained beautifully, but I got so burnt out because there were things that just weren't mm -hmm. being addressed and how I was approaching my performances, my career that really killed that earlier part of my career. And so to be able to work with singers in a way that not only serves their technique at the highest level, but be able to allow them to then do that and translate that in ways that actually serves the longevity and the success of the career that they want is what has been um, the most rewarding work that, and that I spend my time doing now exclusively. I love that you help people cross genres because I was classically trained. Also, I went to a liberal arts school, but it was more of a conservatory style where they didn't teach us anything other than how to be amazing musicians, but we didn't learn business. We didn't learn, you know, the holistic career side, but I came out a great singer, but I was so, I also love pop music. I was also writing that a little bit in secret, although I was in like a Christian pop group for the college that I was in. So luckily I was able to always keep like one foot in each zone. But um, when I came out of school, I did decide like, I don't want to pursue the classical route because I had seen, you know, people that had gone ahead of me and what that meant. Um, but I, I was afraid that I wasn't, I had like learned how to not sing pop music. You know what I mean? Like I had been trained so well in the classical area area and I knew how to sing and make a great sound, but I didn't know how to make a great sound in another genre. And I had seen my classical voice teacher try to sing pop and it was honestly laughable unfortunately oh it's like nails on a chalkboard yeah it's, it's painful and so <laughs> I think a lot of a lot of people were like me and come out and are great singers but don't know how to translate that to other genres have you seen a lot of that and if you help people with that yeah absolutely but I will say though that that the traditional way of training when it comes to the classical and and it's classical and it's musical theater too because it's very similar but even more acute with classical is there the way they teach is they to iron out all the things that are interesting about your voice mm -hmm. so that it is this standard of perfection and it is boring and the problem is this is the way singers american classical singers are taught it's not the way they're taught in europe and in in the rest of the world and so it's not just affecting singers who want to then go maybe do other genres because all they know how to do is this very narrow perfectionist thing. And, you know, when you think about great um, R&B singers, great pop singers, you know, other genres out there, what makes them great are the unique idiosyncrasies in their voice. 
but all you learn in classical music is, is how to just get rid of all that, how to just make this perfectionist thing. And it doesn't just affect you from being able to do other genres. Honestly, it also is affecting American singers from being able to get hired. One of my mm. old friends it, it had, was number two at LA Opera for many years and was in charge of casting. And I would go to LA Opera even to this day. And you look at the roster and it's all these Eastern European singers, not a single American singer doing a lead role. And I would be like, Josh, why are the, why aren't you hiring American singers? And he's like, they're just they're not interesting. Yeah. And it's because the that paradigm of how that classical training is taught does not allow the singer to be able to, on the one hand, sing totally healthfully and sustainably, but on the other hand, allow for all of the uniqueness and the interest in their voice to come out, which is why, number one, they're not hiring the American singers and why classical singers have a really hard time singing other genres because it requires you to tap into that honesty and that uniqueness in, in a much more defined way. Oh, I think that's so true. I've actually had another classical singer on this show who said that exact thing. thing. They're like, they're making carbon copies, yep. right? And so then why should they hire you over someone else if you sound exactly the same? And I know for me, you know, I had great experiences becoming a great choir singer. And I sang in a, an acapella group where you had to blend and all that. And that's great for that. But it it does tend to like iron out those cool things in your voice that would people would like hear me on a loudspeaker and go oh that's free noble or whatever right and that's so that's what you're saying people are now looking for that even in the classical world and the musical theater world they want that uniqueness they they do they just don't know that, that why they're not getting it. it it's how it happens less in the musical theater community but the musical theater community has their own sort of strictures around like what sound is popular right now mm. and it, it ebbs and flows depending on what show is on broadway and who the star is so for example when it was wicked and kristen chenoweth and she's amazing what people don't know about kristen chenoweth is that she has an amazing voice that is her voice is like a chameleon she can do a, lots of things with her voice but what she chose to do to sing Glinda in Wicked was this very kind of like frontal nasally, like popular, popular. It's very here in their sound. And so then, and she's winning Tonys and she's getting exposure. And so now all the other casting people and all the other singers are like, oh, that's the sound we want. That's the mm -hmm. sound we need. And so now everybody's trying to fit their voice into that box. And, and now you have a generation of singers who think that that's what needs to happen, but that's not their sound. And so they're now manipulating and doing things that are not actually organic to them, which gets them in trouble, number one, from a technical standpoint, and they end up with nodes and vocal hemorrhage and other damages because they're manipulating rather than doing something that's, you know, for Kristen Chenoweth, it's natural for her, but it's not going to be natural for you. But if you think you need to fit yourself into this box to get hired, because that's what the casting directors are also looking for now, because that was successful on Broadway, right? So it just creates this vicious thing. So it's not just opera world, you know? Mm. And how and does this translate to pop music? I'm curious because it sounded yeah. like you found sound a found a lot of freedom when you moved over to like pop indie world. But do you find that that even comes into that world? So I did. However, <laughs> what I learned was wherever you go, you take yourself with you. <laughs> and so all of these perfectionist tendencies and you know, needing to sound a certain way, be a certain way, look a certain way, right? It, I brought it all into my pop work. And while I was successful in doing that at, at an indie level, I mean, we're talking early, early aughts, right? Like I'm older than I think I look probably, but we're talking about like, you know, 2002, 2003, right? So at that time, like being an in, in indie artist was a lot harder than it is now. It was just the beginning of iTunes. It was Napster, right? There was no social, there was no, F Facebook it was barely a thing. Like there was mp3.com. That's where I like kind <laughs> right? of got my start. Yeah. And so like, you know, the success that I had was great for what I was able to create, but it, I still was operating under all the, the, the pressure of being like, well, I need to sound like X because this artist is on a major label. And if I'm going to do this, mm. I better sound like that. Cause that's what's quote in style right now. It's, I think those pressures are there no matter what genre you sing. Um, and the work that 
we do with singers is to really undo all that conditioning because it has a huge effect on your body and the sound that it makes because your body cannot do what your brain is sabotaging. Just can't. Mm. And when yeah. as a singer, your whole body is your instrument, not just this. And if you're a human being, then your body is just responding to your thoughts and your feelings. Like that's just what's true for every human on the planet. Um, and so that then can create a set of, you know, those thoughts and feelings. If you feel like you have to be a certain thing or look a certain way or the perfectionist tendencies, all of that, it lives, those feelings and thoughts live in the body and create certain reactions that can sabotage your, your technique, what you already know, but body's not going to do that if it is in fear of failure or fear of less than or fear of all that stuff. So you're going to manipulate control and your body is not going to be able to do what it could otherwise do to create the most effective, most beautiful, most authentic, powerful sound um, that actually gets noticed because it's not like anything else out there. Right. And so it, there's a lot of unlearning and deconditioning for most singers that has to happen in order to get to that place. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I know you've been alluding to this a little bit, but I know you've kind of got this three-legged tripod uh, approach to singing. And some of that very much is what's going on in the brain. So do you want to cover what those three legs are and how they fit together? Yeah. So if you think of your singing career, as a tripod, right? Like the, the tripod upon which a successful singing career stands is three things. It's technique, which we call skill set, right? It's artistry, which we call heart set, and it's mindset. So technique, artistry, mindset, otherwise known as skill set, heart set, mindset. And each of these three legs of the tripod have to be equally strong without one sabotaging the other, because think about it, what happens to a tripod that has a wobbly leg? Hmm. It falls, okay? And most singers who are out there, you know, hustling and they're passionate and they're talented and they're auditioning and recording and performing and they're trying to make it and they're not succeeding at the level that they want is because they're trying to build this career on a wobbly tripod and it doesn't work. So most traditional training only addresses one leg of the tripod technique. And now don't get me wrong. Technique is super important. You need reliable technique because how are you going to access the potential of your instrument if you don't have the technique that supports that to bring it out? And if you're going to be somebody who's going to do, let's say you're on Broadway and you are going to do eight shows a week, or let's say you're a touring artist and you need to be able to do five, six, seven shows a week. The technique is there so that your voice holds up so that you don't have to cancel shows and lose money, right? So the technique is super important. However, technique does not exist in a vacuum. And the only way that you optimize that technique is by making sure that the energy of the body, which is created by the thoughts and the emotions, supports the technique. Because think about it, like we all embody our thoughts and our feelings. And if you think of a basic emotion like fear, right? Like let's say somebody is, is, is scared of a high note, right? And so they have that fear. And so everybody from the beginning of time has the same fear reaction. It's fight or flight. We know this, right? So now you're scared of that high note coming up. And so your body's either going to brace itself to fight that, that note, or it's going to, it's going to flee. It's going to back away from the technique, you know, you're going to, you know, take your foot off the gas. Either way, that thought has created a scenario that your body's reacting to, which sabotages the technique that you otherwise know. And so it doesn't matter. You could have the best technique in the world. And if your brain is sabotaging your body from using it, you're just going to keep creating that same bad sound that's going to make you scared in the first place. So you have the high note approaching, you're in your fear reaction and you, you fight, right? You're in your fight reaction. So now you're going to, in the body, make, push, do, manipulate, force, control. And now you've completely sabotaged the technique that you otherwise know. And now you've created that bad high note that you were scared about in the mm -hmm. first place. And so now what's worse is you have evidence that you're not good enough. You have evidence that it doesn't work. And so now that feeds back into the next time you have a high note to sing. And now you're even more scared. You have even more evidence that you're not good enough, which means that now you're in your fear reaction even more. So for the next note, that high note comes in and it's this negative feedback loop. It just creates this vicious cycle. And that's why these, how these legs of this tripod <clears throat> sort of 
go together. And if training only addresses one part without the other two, we're not creating singers who actually have everything they need to be able to go out there and be successful in their career and stand out above the competition, create impact, which then brings income. Yeah, absolutely. So I know that you're kind of known for taking good singers and making them great. What what do people need to already have under their belt before they work with you? Because I'm, I'm assuming they have to have a certain baseline of technique since you don't really work with beginners. The reason we don't work with beginners is not because you need a certain baseline of technique. Okay. It's because there's usually, when somebody is just a beginner, there's usually not the level of focus, seriousness, commitment, intention that it takes to go from good to great, mm. right? And it's very easy for people to dabble, but the work that we do doesn't work for dabblers. It requires somebody to be full in, all in, have have that that focus and that seriousness about what they're trying to create in their in their career. So when I say we don't work with beginners, I should rephrase that. It's we we do work with people who have not taken voice lessons before, but they are people who are out there trying to create real careers. They're they're auditioning, they're gigging, they're performing. You know, you might be a singer songwriter who is really hustling, but you've never actually focused on your voice before. That we will work with you absolutely because you're in, you're at that level where you're you're already doing what you're doing, and we just want to take it here. Mm. And so we're not we don't work with people who are like, I just want to sing better for to sing at my uncle's wedding, or right. you know, I just I want to be able to just do better at karaoke, or right. you know, I'm leading worship in church and I don't want to crack or what? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Like because there's just to do the kind of work we do. It's deep, it's deep work. It's transformational work. It's holistic work. And what I have found is those kinds of people, they're just number one, they're not really interested in that kind of work. And number two, they're just not ready for it from, from that place of intention, you know, and without the intention, it doesn't work anyway, because they're not going to do the work and they're not going to invest in it either. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And I think it, that doesn't matter if it's singing or anything, right? It related to music. If you're a dabbler, you're not going to you're not going to make progress in anything. And that's frustrating for them and frustrating for us as the people that are trying to help them. So I think that that definitely makes sense. I wanted to ask, as we were talking earlier about, about the uniqueness in someone's voice, how, how do you discover that? And how do you bring that back if they've like ironed it out? That's why the mindset piece of the work that we do is so essential. Mm because a singer, what we do is support them in all of this mindset work to learn how to fail, <laughs> to learn how to be willing to make a bad sound, to be willing to, like so many times I can't even tell you, I'll be in studio class with our singers and I'll be like, I dare you to F it up. Yeah. Like, I dare you to make a bad sound right now. And Every single time I will tell you what happens is, you know, when they've worked that mindset and they have the ability to let go and do that, the sound that they make is 10 times better than what happened when they were, quote, trying to make a bad sound. And so the mindset work is essential then to be able to set those foundations, to undo limiting beliefs, old stories that, that somebody's telling themselves that they're still aligning with that they don't even realize. And I will tell you, Brie, that nine times out of 10, it's stuff that has nothing to do with singing that is 150% coming in and affecting their ability to let go and just trust their technique, trust their body, trust their talent, trust what they were given and let that be enough. Because most people come in and they are so filled with this not enough stuff. They have to you know, sound a certain way, be a certain way, look a certain way, all the stuff that's convincing them that they're not, which is why then they get into proving mode trying mode that actually disconnects them from that uniqueness, that authenticity. And so it's connecting back to what is special, what is the worth? And that's all the mindset work that we do in the program. In addition to the high level technique work, like these things have to go hand in hand, you know, that brings that. Yeah. Most singers have at least one, if not many, just like side comments that were made about their singing from the past 
from someone who probably doesn't even matter that sticks in your mind and you're just like, oh, better not do that. Or, you know, oh, uh, you know, this part of my voice, someone doesn't like it. So therefore I should get rid of that. And I mean, I, as an experience, I have those and I still remember them. And those people, they don't, I will never see them again. You know what I mean? But they're still there. (laughs) And so that's why the mindset is so important, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because again, like your body is your instrument and your body can't do what your brain is sabotaging. And so if you have an old limiting belief, like from some person that you just embodied, that was like, oh, your your high voice isn't good. You're an alto. You don't, you're not Mm -hmm. a, Mm -hmm. yeah. So now anytime the pitch rises, and I'm not even talking about, singing in the highest part of your range. I'm just talking about, we have, we have an ascension of pitch, right? Now, all of a sudden body goes into that, (laughs) that like, oh, you know, because somebody gave you a belief, you didn't even choose it. Somebody gave you that belief that you then latched onto, which is now putting you in that. (gasps) and, And if your body is here, you can't lean into your support. You can't be in the open channel of energy for sound. You're going to be controlling and and intention. And tension is the enemy of the singer. And the mindset things that that sabotage us, put us in those tensions. And we don't want to fail and we don't want to sound bad. And so we we go into the control mechanisms to try to mitigate that. But those control mechanisms are actually the very thing that take us out of the most powerful sound and that most healthy technique that we could otherwise have. Yeah. I mean, even things like when I was going through trying to blend my break, you know, just even saying like this, these notes are my break, like immediately in my mind, I'm like, oh, that's, you know, that's an A or that's a B flat. Oh my gosh. You know, I have to like tense up and freak out because I don't know if I should sing this in head voice or chest voice, you know, just all those, those things that are in the back of your mind. Even the language. Yeah. The language of calling it a break. Yes. Like, how does that, how does that sabotage you from the very beginning? Yep. Because, and, and every single singer that comes to work with me has the terminology of break, right? I mean, you're not alone in this. It's just part of this, the, I don't know, zeitgeist of singing language, right? But I hate it because it implies a, an interruption, a chasm, mm-hmm. uh, right? And, and now uh, what is your body going to do? Like, if you literally, I'm picturing like Roadrunner coming up against the edge of right. the cliff, like hitting the, his heels into the ground. Yeah. Right. That's what your body does because, oh my God, I got a break. And that very thing interrupts how the, the efficient use of your body and your technique. So now you have actually created a quote break. And, and so the mindset is so key to this. And it's not how traditional singers, traditional training is for singers. And it is killing singers' careers. I watched it affect my own and it took me 10 years of my own uh, explorations into mindset work, into spirituality, into psychology, and piecing this all together from experts who were not in the singing world. And it took me, you know, 10 years of sometimes walking down dead ends and creating, you know, falling into every pothole that I possibly could. But then at the end of the, the, once I was able to synthesize this, like the difference that it made in my sound in my confidence, in my ability to make an impact. And that's the thing. Your only job as a singer, as a performer really of any kind, but as a singer, is to make an impact on your audience and do it in a sustainable, healthy way. And if you don't make that impact, there is no career. Impact equals income. That's Mm -hmm. that's it. The bigger the impact, the bigger the income. You know, why can Bruno Mars charge $750 a ticket for his concert? Taylor Swift, $1,100? Because they know how to make that impact. Like, are they the most perfect singers? No, but they know how to get out of their own way, make an amazing sound and impact the audience with it. And, you know, some people are born with that ability, lucky them, and others can be taught. This can be taught, but it takes a level of seriousness and commitment because what we're talking about is like peeling away these things and allowing that trust and that 
that the technique that you otherwise know and teaching you the foundation of that to be able to stand in that confidence and know that that's enough. You know how hard it is to stand in front of an audience and not feel like you need to push or prove or do anything, but like stand in that vulnerability of I am enough. My technique is enough. I trust it. I know who I am and just let that be enough. It is so hard. And it takes a, a level of commitment and seriousness to be able to get there. But for those singers who are really invested in their careers, we, we show you how to do that. And it can be taught, you know? Interesting. So do you think that there, there has to be a certain level of talent to be successful as a singer? Or do you think that you can teach most people to be at that level eventually if they learn their technique and all the mindset stuff? Right. That's a really good question. You know, um, I do think there's sort of, what's the phrase I'm looking for? Um, luck of birth, luck of, um, uh -huh. you know what I'm talking about? I'm not getting the phrase right. Uh, yeah, just like- Luck of genetics. Luck of genetics, luck of birth. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Um, and, you know, because not everybody is going to achieve whatever, Adele status, right? Celine Dion status, you know? However, as long my personal belief is, as long as somebody can match pitch and embody rhythm and melody, anybody can go from like, you know, whatever, zero to 10. Now, you may be born with a level of talent that starts you at 10, which means now we're going from 10 to 50. You might be born with 50. So now we're going from 50 to 150, right? But there is so much that can be um, expanded on whatever God-given gift you are given. But unfortunately, those God-given gifts are not equal, you know? Yes, but people might also have another God-given gift that they, they pair with, you know, maybe they get to the 10 level on singing, but then they are like an amazing songwriter or they're yes. like, just like they have a magnetic personality or whatever. Yes, absolutely. But also that ability to really tap in and, and allow yourself to be authentic and seen, like that is the most impactful thing. And when you do that, the voice actually it evolves and the voice actually improves and becomes more um, powerful. You know, when I think of some of the great performers in the past, like Bob Dylan comes to mind, weird voice, yep. weird voice. And yet he knows how to use it in the most authentic, impactful way for him. Somebody else who didn't, somebody else who maybe was stuck in blocks and patterns around their sound would have you know, judged it, tried to control it, tried to manipulate it and, and not have had the career that he had because he just allowed himself to be authentic and that's the sound. But believe it or not, that's a skill that he had to cultivate over time, whether he did it, you know, knowingly and intentionally or whether he was just able to recognize something within himself that when he just let that be, people responded, you know? And there's there's a, a a process for those people where the, it's not intuitive to do that, how it maybe was for him to be able to let go and learn how to tap into that. And so then whatever sound you're given can flourish uniquely and authentically, and you're going to get a, a lot farther because of it, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, let me let me present a scenario. I'm curious to to see what you think about this. So you have somebody who's a good singer. They're really good at marketing. They're really good at promotion, all that stuff. And then there's someone who's done your program, like an amazing singer and all that stuff, but like they haven't figured out all the marketing stuff yet. Do you think that the person who's got all the marketing chops is going to win? Or do you think eventually the person who really worked on their voice is going to, you know, figure the other stuff out and, and be miles ahead? Right. That's a great question. So I think the person who is good, but has figured all the marketing stuff out, they can, they, they will get to a certain level, but they will not go past it mm. because you can put the full force of a marketing budget and marketing smarts behind whatever the product is, let's say it's a recording or whatever. But if that recording does not land and make that visceral impact on the audience, it's only going to go so far. It doesn't mm. matter how much marketing you put behind it, right? If you, if you think of it like a widget, if the widget is not effective, now you're just throwing marketing money and dollars behind a widget that is only going to be so effective because it's 
it's not doing the maximum potential of what it could do. You know what I'm saying? So an artist who doesn't know how to tap in and make that impact, it's almost like, you know, I hear this from artists all the time. Like, I just need, the reason I'm not succeeding is I just need money. I just need $10,000 for a marketing budget. And I'm like, okay, so you've, you've already gotten out there and you've released recordings and they're only getting a couple of thousand plays, which tells you that they're not really making the kind of impact that they need to make. When you post it on social media, people are not listening to it over and over and over again. When you put it on YouTube, they're not listening to it. So you have data that it's not making those, that those performances are not making the kind of impact that they need to. And so you're telling me that now you want to spend $10,000 to market something that's not making an impact. You mm -hmm. might as well take $10,000, put it in the toilet and flush it. That's my personal opinion for what it's worth. Take it or leave it. Okay. However, a person who has that ability and knows how to make that impact. Now, if they don't have marketing chops, it's a crapshoot. Mm. It, it, it may get it may get, you know, if they're not putting it out anywhere, now we have a different mindset problem. Why? Why are you not? Like, what is that? You know, if they're putting it out and it makes an impact, it starts to get a little bit of traction. It starts to get some notice. It starts to get, and now you put, you teach that person how to market. And I'm also a firm believer, like know your wheelhouse, right? Like know what your, know what your, your zone of genius is understand the other aspects of your career, understand the marketing so that you can then hire somebody who it is a zone of genius. Like don't go in it blind, right? So whether you can create that zone of genius for yourself, now you have, you know, two pieces of the puzzle that are going to skyrocket. Or if you know enough to be able to hire somebody whose zone of genius that is, now at least what you're marketing has the best shot because it makes that impact. Right. Whether it's, you know, hiring the right producer, getting the marketing team, getting the right management, none of that matters, in my personal opinion, if the widget, if the performance is not making an impact. So that has to be the thing first before we do anything else. That's my belief. Yeah. No, I experienced actually an example of this the other day. I was someone suggested me, oh, how about we do this song um, in church? Because I lead worship in church. And I was like, they sent me a, a Spotify and I listened to it. And I'm like, eh, it's okay. It's fine. And I was like, let me just see if there's any other versions of the song out there. I'm just not quite getting the, the gist of the song. And I found another version and I was blown away because of the way that the singer sang it. It was a completely different song to me. And the first thing that I did was I sent it to like several people. I'm like, oh my gosh, do you think we should do this song in church? This is amazing. Yeah. Right. So not only does it cause me to keep listening to it, but it also makes me want to share it because of the impact that that singer had on me and also elevated that song. Right. Right. So I know I, people tell me all the time, I just don't have the right song. I just don't have the right producer. I just don't have this. I just don't have that. And then I listen to them and I'm like, no, what you just don't have is the ability to tap into the maximum potential of your instrument to create that impact. Mm. When you have that, then the right producer matters, then the right marketing team matters. But without that, it, it's just chasing good money with that, you know? Mm, yeah. Well, this has been an amazing conversation. And I know that the singers that are listening or watching have really benefited. Is there anything else that you want to be sure and tell singers out there? Well, like, what is your, your stage advice? So, you know, I ask, I get asked a lot, Bree, okay, so how do you, how do you make that impact? Like, how do you do that? And of course, my first answer is <laughs> how much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> like, this is what we deep dive into in the, in the intensive in eight weeks of like intensive training on, you know, but the simplistic answer to that is it's about the mind body connection, which I was, you know, alluding to and talking about earlier. Um, but the way that, the way that a singer goes from good to great is by being able to have a mind-body connection that works for them instead of against them, instead of sabotaging them. And all the ways that I've been talking about today, you know, about body can't do what brain is sabotaging and the connection between the negative feedback loop and fear reaction, all these things, it's, it's all just, you know, specific examples of how mind-body connection, when you have set up those neuro pathways and you have that, that muscle memory and that emotional memory to connect these two things, that's how the most authentic performance, the most efficient technique, the most impactful 
sound is created. And, you know, at the level that the singers that we work with, like at the level that they're playing at, it's not enough to be good. There's mm -hmm. a lot of good singers out there. And if you want to be the kind of singer, you know, who gets a gig every once in a while and you only get paid 200 bucks for it, or maybe you don't get paid at all. Maybe you're releasing records and nobody's really listening to them. Like there's a lot of singers out there who are able to do that and they're good and they're all quote good. But what catapults the singers into great is being able to have a mind body connection that actually serves their instrument to create the most impactful performance. And that's what we help singers do in the form of high level technique, high level professional mindset work, um, and explorations into unique artistry and then world-class support to be able to do it because for the majority you know, of them, and for probably a lot of you guys who are listening, if you're singers out there, um, these are not issues that you've able, able to fix yourself ever you know, because most of the time we're too close to it and we can't see it. And the level of support that's needed to be able to take, to go from good to great. It's really easy to go from nothing to good. Actually, mm -hmm. there's like a lot there's, you know, but the, the, the learning curve, you know, the, the exponential learning that it takes to go from good to great, it might only be from here to here, but it take what it takes to go from here to here is a lot more support, a lot more commitment, and a lot more investment of time, energy, money, whatever it may be, than it is to go from here to here. Mm. You know I mean, from the bottom to the middle. So um, I don't know. I'm on my soapbox. I get really powerful and passionate about this, Bree, as you can tell. <laughs> no, I love it. I love it. And I'm sure there are many out there that are getting as riled up as well. And so if they want to connect with you, how can they connect with you online and learn more about what the programs that you have? Yeah. So there's two things and I'm going to give you links so that you can pop them into the um, podcast notes for anybody who's interested. So if what you're hearing, if you're really resonating with this and you're somebody who's, who is in the game, right? You're a singer uh, of any genre where you're out there auditioning, hustling, recording, performing, and you're just not seeing the results that you want in the form of the, the, the impact and the income and the opportunities that you would otherwise think that you'd be making by now, um, you can book a call directly with me. Um, and so I'll put the call link uh, for Brie that, that you can use. Um, you'll fill out a short uh, application just to you know uh, qualify, and then you'll have access to my calendar and you can hop on my calendar and we'll have a call, you know, about 45 minutes. We'll talk about what's working, what's not working um, in your singing, what you want, where you want to go with it, the gap between where you are and where you want to go. Um, and I'll, you know, share with you the ways that we work with singers. And if it's a fit for us to work together, fantastic. If not, that's okay too. The call is really about clarity because you'll really understand the exact steps that you need to take um, in order to get, in order to get to your goals. So that's one option. If you've really resonated and you just want to get on my calendar. Um, the other option is that, uh, I'm going to give Brie the link to a masterclass that I did, um, around basically the five steps that it takes to really go from good to great. And so a bit more of a deep dive, um, so that you can, uh, you know, have, have a little bit more of like a learning experience. If that's something you're interested in, I'm going to, I'll give Brie, the link to that as well. Um, and they're not mutually exclusive. If you watch that and then you want to book a call, you can do that too. Cool. That is awesome. Thank you for those resources. And we'll be sure to put them in the show notes. And thank you so much, Arden, for just sharing all of your, your experience as a singer, your life experience and all that you've learned. I mean, I know that it can help so many people you know, not have to go through all of that themselves to hear this from someone else. And that's why I think it's so impactful to share our stories and, and things that we've learned to just cut that learning curve for other people. So thank you so much for doing that. You're so welcome. I know it took me 10 years. And so I'd rather it take me 10 years so that I can condense it so that you guys can get the transformation. And what we do is only it's two months. And I know people are like, what, how can you do that in two months? It's because we're doing it differently. We're not doing it the old fashioned way anyway. But thank you, Brie, for, you know, being able to be such a light and being able to share so many different resources and so many different philosophies around performing and being a woman in this field and being able to do this in a way that supports ourselves, our families, because at the end of the day, if we're not enjoying ourselves when we're doing this, then what's the point anyway? And so to be able to have resources that you bring and do that, I think it's super important. Mm, thank you so much. And I totally agree. Thanks for listening to The Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. 
leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.